Hello, it's Scott Manley here with Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. Part 34, Gail Porter has successfully landed on the moon and collected all the science that she could carry in her, uh, well, her pockets, I guess. Do spacesuits have pockets? Of course they do. They have pockets, they have pouches, they have Velcro bits where you can stick things on and you can attach science to all of it. I mean, really, if you're going to be an astronaut exploring things, you want as much place to store things because, let's face it, you don't want to be going back in through the airlock to pick up all those things that you've forgotten. Anyway, she now is faced with the task of returning home, and thanks to over-designing this mission, it looks like I have way more Delta V than I will ever need. I have like a, a hundred and... sorry, I have 1,400 uh, meters per second of Delta V from that engine, plus another 2,000 from the emergency thrusters. So it's just a case of putting this spacecraft back on course and perhaps using uh, you know, the reaction control system to fine-tune things. The real danger now is that perhaps I come in too steep, right? But I would presume that after uh, losing one astronaut and returning several others safely that I have solved those problems. Anyway, as luck would have it, the plane of rotation or the plane of orbit is pretty much still in line with the Kerbin, which means I don't need much adjustment. In fact, I overdo my initial maneuver node and uh, finally get a decent maneuver that puts it somewhere above the surface without slamming hard into, into the hard lithosphere of Earth. I mean, truthfully, we did not spend much time on the moon because... Uh, well, because, you know, we can do all the science we can instantly, and there's no point in traveling long distances to different biomes in the moon, because that's really, really hard. Engines light, and off we go. Engines are safely lit. This thing is wobbling around rather terribly. It seems to be performing some kind of shimmy around the longitudinal axis. But other than that, I think we're doing fine. That shimmy is, seems to be exaggerating somewhat. Gail Porter is of course a professional and will not be sick. Uh, at least if she does vomit due to motion sickness, she will be very careful to direct it anywhere but on the very important controls and the science and her food. And listen, you know what, if you're going to be sick in space, odds are you're going to vomit on something that is important. I mean, I guess the only saving grace is that this is a solo mission, and therefore, she's not going to be throwing up over her crewmates. Because, you know, they will be the ones that are filing the reports about how awesome you are and how much they want to work with you. And you've, if you throw up over them, odds are you might not get another flight. But, uh, yeah, she seems to just be quite enjoying this, to be honest. I think, uh, <laughs> I, think I may have misunderstood her tolerance for motion sickness. But now we are free of the moon's sphere of influence, and it is time to adjust our uh, our periaps just a little. Anyway, as it happens, we're going to be uh, doing some flying with old me here. Now, of course, uh, old me is in a different time, therefore there is no chance that old me will vomit on new me or vice versa. So we don't have to worry about getting on like that, but we do have to realize that inevitably one will become the other. Anyway, point is, it's one of those old me versus new me moments because things may not go according to plan. Ah, engine going! And I'm just going to try and eyeball this 900, 900. Oh, no, we're going up. That is wrong. Okay, never mind. I can't correct that. Try and pick a better attitude this time, Scott. Okay, trying to turn it around. I'm basically eyeballing this because we have so much Delta V here. There we go. Five, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Oh, damn. Damn. Okay. Overdid it, but that's fine. You know, we can just ditch this thing and we'll use the engines on board the capsule. These engines are much smaller, so we can, you know, use them for finer tuning or things like that. We don't need that extra stage, and having it slam into the ground faster than the rest is really going to be good science. No doubt they'll be interested to see what happens when a fuel tank traveling at 12 kilometers per second slams into the surface. Anyway, um, what we want to do is bring up these engines. We have a cluster of five pressure-fed engines on the back here. And we're probably only going to need the one on this. This was totally over-designed. We have like two kilometers per second of Delta V. And the real thing we need to do is just fine-tune it. So right-click and... Oh. Feet pressure too low. 
Um, did I put the wrong kind of fuel tank on this again? Did I make that really, really dumb mistake? Um, okay, uh, so it doesn't matter if I turn those engines on or not because they're not going to work and I've just ditched my propulsion system. Uh, well, and I've noticed my periapse has gone down. So I think, I think my best option here is to actually perform the good old-fashioned wobble deorbit, but actually use that to raise my periaps. And we're going to do that. So we're going to try and figure out an attitude which will let me wobble this back and forth and raise the periaps to an acceptable level. Let's try this. Watch the numbers. Numbers are going up. Numbers are going up. That is good. Okay, we're into the 60s. That is a successful maneuver. Okay. Old me has left the building and new me is back in because this was a long and tedious process involving, yes, wobbling the thing back and forth to get a net delta V out of this thing. It is, of course, using rotational reaction control systems, which are offset from the center of mass, to actually get uh, an actual velocity out of this. And you can see that we've pushed the periaps up above zero which is good. We just need to push it up maybe to 60 or thereabouts so that when we re-enter, we don't basically plunge through the atmosphere too quickly and have the aerodynamic stresses build up so quickly that it crushes the capsule, burns it up, and uh, takes all that sweet, sweet science with it. Not to mention Gale, because we have only one backup astro astronaut other than this, and it would be unfortunate if we had to send them this mission again. Of course, while I'm saying that, you know that's new me, and new me, of course, knows what happened in this. So, can you detect in my voice whether this was a success or failure? Well, I think you can tell by now that pretty much we are on the road to success, thanks to Gail Porter's understanding of, you know, mechanics, of rocket systems, and improvisation that will serve her well. There we go. We are above, we're in the 60s, and now we are just going to fall back towards the surface and hopefully, we're going to have a good day when we land. All the science has been loaded. And we're just going to stabilize this in a reasonable orientation. And once it's stabilized, we will let time acceleration illustrate the effects of gravity in a way that can only be missed by a blinking of an eye. Or would be missed if you blinked an eye. It's called time warp, right? So... There's the moon saying farewell, and yeah, we didn't actually leave anything on the moon because we didn't leave a we didn't leave a flag, and the base stage actually went and crashed back into the moon. Also, this third stage also crashed into the moon. So, all we've left really are craters. That will really help the moon hoaxers' case in you know 30, 50, 40, 50 years time, right? Uh oh, look, we're coming in towards the mirror image Earth. Everything's upside down. Am I going to get back and find that Tatiana has a beard? No, we're going to turn around and find out that the, the spacecraft was upside down. Well, ditching that heat shield and my periaps has dropped down to below 60. Well, didn't expect that. Still, we have plenty of reaction control, um, you know, fuel to keep this spacecraft oriented. There it is going, exploding. Something's exploding somewhere off screen, but still with an audible range there. Of course, inside the capsule, odds are Gale can't hear any of it. It's just for us that are riding outside the capsule. Um, of course, if we were riding outside the capsule, we would be more concerned with burning up unless we were godlike camera drones viewing the spacecraft from the exterior, able to appreciate the look on that uh, of that um, re-entry shield. You know, that would be really cool, by the way, if SpaceX or something would deploy some sort of camera drone that could look at the re-entry close up. I'm telling you, I would pay for that footage. That would be awesome. Also, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of stuff SpaceX could do that I would like to see. I mean, sure, ULA could do it, but they are still only pushing 480p video out of YouTube. They're in some other, you know, decade for some reason. Even the Russians are now pushing out 1080p video. ULA are so far behind the times in, ter in terms of their uh, coverage. Uh, but yeah, then again, maybe, you know, Jeff will come along, Jeff Bezos will come along and say, hey, you know, you got to use Amazon Cloud Storage and push out big 
data files and high resolutions because, you know, kids are all about the data and the bits and the high resolutions. Anyway, descending through the atmosphere, carrying a triumphant smell with it, parachutes are deployed, and Gale watches the water come up, returning to capture in her in its loving embrace. And hopefully not to drown her in the moments after landing. Because you know what? That has actually happened, that capsules have landed and sank with people inside them. Thankfully, they were rescued. But that is a glorious achievement. We have sent someone to the moon. We have landed them. We have brought them back. And we have a ton of money, a ton of science. We can pretty much build out everything that we need in terms of uh, space center upgrades. We are very happy on that front. We have quite a lot of science that we could spend on all the good stuff. But honestly, I think at this point, we need to think about starting to wrap up everything else. So we have a few other spacecraft for which we should uh, take a look at their progress. In particular, we have the Martian device. The Martian device is flying into Martian space here, collecting tons and tons of data. We set it up with a 100 meter per second burn, except that because of the way maneuver nodes are calculated, that we have some sort of strange number changing thing going on here. So I just decided to delete the node and wait until we're really close to periaps before setting up that 100 meter per second burn. So for comparison, the first spacecraft to visit Mars and return pictures was at Mariner 4. Mariner 4, uh, let me see, it actually was interesting because it was the first spacecraft to return close-up pictures of another planet. Uh, it used solar cells for power, and it had a, an, a battery and everything going on. It also had uh, an attitude control system, which, in addition to usual thrusters, it actually had like little photo, uh, you know, light vanes on the end of the solar panels, so it could flip these around and get different differential solar radiation pressure to rotate the spacecraft without using the reaction control thrusters. Anyway. We encountered a problem. We ran out of battery power. This was a problem. <laughs> I mean, yes, this was really terrible. As we were falling in, because we were rotating so fast, uh, the spacecraft was not getting the power that it needed. So I tried turning things off. And because we had no power, we couldn't send a transmission to it. But eventually, we got a little bit of power to recharge it. So I, during that brief window, I shut down the avionics on the spacecraft, hoping that uh, that would then let the battery recharge. We have a limited amount of time to make this happen. We have, you can see the time ticking down there. So there we get, was 11 minutes? Okay, we had that happen. And now you can actually see that we are getting battery power back. We have averted the crisis. It almost scrubbed the mission. If we had not been able to perform that capture burn, we would be, well, destined for another trip around the sun and Frankly, I'd prefer not to do that. So get all our science data. It turns out that what had happened was one of our transmissions was still going when we performed time acceleration, and that basically sucked down all our battery power really quickly. And when it then tried to recover, it was spinning too fast. Yeah, you know, these are the kind of things that are the nearest you would get to the mission, you know, to the experience of mission control where you're trying to troubleshoot things that aren't quite working the way they planned and you're running out of power. That's not something I planned. So we found out that we have some telemetry data and things like that. So because of the way the game works or because of the way remote tech works, we uh, end up having to wait for those things to come through anyway. Setting up the maneuver for capture. Look at that beautiful image of space probe, Martian device flying in front of Mars. We now pass close enough to get close scientific data, send all that home, waiting for all that extra science. We can appreciate the beautiful northern pole, or southern pole, I think it's the northern pole in this case. And I guess the way it's drawn means that the biomes are actually quite clustered around the North Pole here. And we get a lot of options and we transmit all those biomes back very, very quickly. Hmm, there's some sort of strange hexagonal pattern at the Pole of Mars. Perhaps it was made by some sort of artificial intelligence. Anyway, uh, yeah, we're about to get set up for the burn and while that burn happens, uh, I, I'm going to ask, you know, 
Do you understand? you think you understand how Kerbal Space Program planets work? The planets, as you may have heard, are actually deformed cubes. So, explain to me why we have a triangular shape at the pole, eh? That's one for the smart people out there. Answers, write your answers on the side of a space probe and send it into deep space, and I'll pick a winner. Anyway, having performed a low pass over Mars, uh, th next thing I wanted to do was do some flybys of the two moons that we have, Phobos and Deimos. Now, what we're really going to do, well, what we're going to do is essentially perform a high-speed flypass. So I'm adjusting the radius of the orbit, adjusting the semi-major axis of the orbit, reducing the eccentricity by performing a burn at the apoapse. I'm, of course, doing it there because that will be the most efficient place for me to do it. I purposely left the orbit highly eccentric so that I could do this. Now, the real challenge here is that the automated burn system is never quite accurate in terms of the delta V. It tends to overshoot by about 0.3 meters per second, and I'm guessing it's because it expects to throttle back the engine and get, you know, less than 100% thrust, whereas realism overhaul, it doesn't let you do that. So uh, I have to do multiple correction, multiple course corrections to synchronize the orbit, and then what I do typically is I set up the maneuver and then roll back the delta V just a little to make sure that I actually encounter it in the correct place. And after a lot of tweaking, we have a 30 kilometer encounter and with a little tweaking more and of course a little rolling back, we managed to get this thing very, very close to so an asteroid hugging our us. There we go. Now, just hoping we won't actually hit that. So Phobos and Deimos, they are two of the smaller moons in the solar system. They're irregular asteroid-like objects orbiting Mars. Phobos and Deimos are, of course, named after the, uh, you know, the mythical horses that drew the God of War's chariot. Phobos is closer in, and because it's so close in, it actually orbits faster than Mars rotates. And because it's orbiting faster, that means that the tidal friction and uh, the atmospheric friction are slowing it down. So it is eventually going to fall closer and closer to Mars and eventually get torn up by tidal forces. Probably split into a ring rather than actually landing on Mars, but either way, it'd be pretty awesome to see. Anyway, I've switched this thing back to real unaccelerated time so you can appreciate just how fast I flew past Phobos. Phobos is about 11 kilometers across, so the close approach really gets a... Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just lightning fast. And even if I uh, transmit the science data, I cannot get the science data into the system quickly enough to uh, collect all the data I need. So a lot of science just goes to waste, potentially, if there were many biomes. I hope there weren't many biomes, but if there's a ton of biomes, I only got one. So yes, uh, we can repeat this whole procedure and ultimately get an encounter with Deimos. But at this point, I'm uh, really deciding that I think uh, it's time to put this to rest. The science output from this has been amazing. I've learned all sorts of fascinating things about realism. And I think actually given some of the drama that's going on in the modding community, I might just come up with a series next which is 100% stock, maybe with a couple of cool mods. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out, but I think this is the place where I draw the line under Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. Yes, I could also do the Mercury flyby and all that other stuff, but I think I'll wait until uh, I'll wait until the realism overhaul has settled down once again and becomes stable. Then maybe I'll do some example missions. But yeah, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this series. I'm glad for all of you kept tuning in and offering interesting advice. I thoroughly enjoyed it when things went wrong because it gave me a chance to think my way through problems. And I will continue creating new Kerbal content and creating new videos. And I hope you guys continue to tune in. Until the next time, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.